probably should, I should get going. All right, um, so we'll, we'll start going here. Uh, so it's a pleasure to have Mohammed uh, here give a talk. Uh, this is going to kick off uh, a series of, uh, of talks today from, from people who are at, at Europe's. Uh, it's a little, real pleasure to have Mohammed. Uh, he's been, uh, he did his PhD at Rutgers and then uh, went on to uh, do a postdoc at FAIR. Uh, now a visiting uh, faculty at, uh, at Stanford and will start his, uh, his uh, true faculty job at KAUST in a little while. Um, I actually known Mohammed for, for a very long time. I tried to recruit him as, a, as an intern at Disney at, at one point and he ended up going somewhere else, and then we tried to recruit him as a postdoc, and he ended up going to FAIR. <laughs> and so uh, I'm hoping that uh, one of these days we'll actually co a paper together. Uh, he's done all sorts of uh, things on um, zero-shot learning, on uh, language and vision, and more, more recently really a lot of work on creative AI, which has been um, everywhere, including, I guess, on TV, on HBO series, and, and so on. So. Uh, really cool, cool work, so I'm excited about hearing his talk. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. That's probably one of the nicest introductions I've ever had. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to, to an honor to, to be here. And, uh, yeah, I, I hope that you will enjoy this talk. So um, today I'm going to talk to you about uh, a topic that uh, I feel very passionate about. We we might call it imagination and this part, the uh, vision. It is really a lot to how I reflected in the past maybe five to seven years about uh, how AI can can uh, imagine and this imagination, how what kind of sort of skills that that uh, machines can do if if we uh, integrate this ingredient into as a learning component. Um, so before I start, I'd like to thank a lot of great people that uh, joined my journey so far in uh, Facebook uh, and collaborators from from Baidu, Adobe, uh, Oxford, Georgia Tech, uh, Berkeley, etc. So without the, I think the, the this family, a lot of this work won't be possible. Um, so let's start. Like imagination is a key element of human intelligence that enables the humanity to progress to an ever faster rate. It helps us to create uh, art, uh, beauty, and, and, and a lot of other things. But also it helps us to understand the visual world. So. Uh, uh, a lot of people may not know what Parkirovda is, but if I describe this in, in language and say Parkirovda is a, a small bird that has an orange beak and the bird plumage is dark above and, and white below, maybe this description will help you imagine, will trigger your imagination to think how this bird may look like in your head. And then probably uh, selecting to the relevant bird among these different ones would would be able to be an easier task. Uh, this shows that we learn from language descriptions, and possibly we can develop machines that have a similar uh, similar skill. So uh, my research is about trying to leverage and model this skill to help machines to imagine to see and imagine to create. So the machine. The reflection of imagination to see is, is on tasks like uh, understanding unseen classes. So we don't know what this product is up with, or what most, most of us, but describing them helps us to, to see it and, and distinguish it from others. Uh, imagination to create is, is, is have, a similar, have a similarity to this task because this is about understanding unseen objects, and this is about creating a likable uh, unseen. So creating the unseen and understanding the unseen. So in this talk, part of, of major, a major part of this talk is to cover some of the uh, recent advances in these two and how they actually influence each other. So going from uh, the short learning, which is most of the work I did in my PhD, and then they were doing some work about creating unseen, and how actually some of the losses that we have developed here can actually reflect back and improve uh, understanding unseen objects, which is the 
which is uh, in my recent uh, ICCV 19 paper. So that's that's it's called creativity inspired zero shot learning. That's that's going from here to healthcare. So so uh, why first of all why why do we care about uh, uh, helping machines to imagine to see? Um, so the, it is estimated that there exists more than 10,000 bird species in, in our planet, and the uh, vast majority, uh, 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 <coughs> and the largest available collection of, uh, of data for birds that we have so far, at least academically, have only a few hundreds. This means that for thousands of these birds, we don't have any uh, pictures, or the best we would hope for is to have a single image, maybe in Wikipedia. So this motivated a lot of people to work on the task of zero-shot visual cognition. Uh, and this task is, is about uh, having a set of training classes. Some people call it C classes. And this case would be applied for the upper source crystal output the American crow. And, uh, and at this time, we have a, a, a test set of unseen classes, like, for example, parking open and fish crow. Uh, and but in order to enable understanding unseen classes without having any pictures, we need to provide some uh, side uh, information. Uh, and this is basically how these uh, unseen classes look like. Very similar to the description of the bucket book that I provide. We didn't, we didn't see a single picture, but we can describe, we need, to, we need to describe these unseen classes somehow, either by attributes or by, by language description. Um, Yeah. So uh, the work in Jewish planning has been pioneered by Lampert uh, uh, it, uh, and Farhadi et al. And back in 2009, and a lot of a series of, of work uh, that, that happens after. And, uh, in, and it was in many in the context of attribute-based zero-shot learning. And in this case, we, we, uh, 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 we expect to describe an unseen class as a set of attributes, like this table. Uh, for example, wing color is black and white, the head pattern is, uh, is cap, uh, etc. Uh, but the, the, one of the key problems here is that the, uh, there's a dilemma of finding the set, uh, best set of attributes and defining them uh, to start with. Uh, the second thing is manual uh, annotations. This set of attributes are typically in hundreds, and manually setting this set of attributes uh, per single class is. Uh, uh, could actually be boring and requires a lot of uh, labor, and uh, um, and also some some in some cases this is this could be an example of the interface. So some in some of these cases you require to collect it not even per single class, but but selecting but collecting it per single image and then average them per class. So which which is uh, a lot of effort. So back in 2013. Uh, we worked on uh, uh, a, a task called write a, we named the write a classifier, which is about the same task, but we want to describe the classes from uh, unstructured language for, for that may come from Wikipedia <coughs> article. No, in this case, we don't need to define this, but we uh, define the set of attributes. We need to relate directly the descriptions that comes from Wikipedia to, to images to recognize the, the, the visual class. Uh, so this makes it easy because we can easily get this uh, uh, language description of a class by just Googling their bird name. In fact, actually, and while we're studying this, we just uh, uh, wrote a script that pulled up most of the articles of these uh, classes. And we, we followed up this with a second manuscript that verifies that every class is correct. So we had to correct some of them, but most of them were, were OK. Uh, and, but there is also another challenge that this language description could be noisy. It may include some descriptions that are actually non-visual. So a noise suppression component it could be necessary to, to enable uh, successful social recognition. So some of the language description could be uh, this bird uh, migrate from this place to another place, which could be irrelevant to recognition task at hand. So, so let's start by, sim by, by simple notations. In, if we talk about a simple linear classifier for, to, to, to classify class K, and let's say it's just cats and dogs, uh, we, we, can, we may define this as a FK of 
uh, x equal to ck uh, transpose t, uh, where ck is a classifier of class k. So we have, may have imagine we have c cat and c dot for for classifying an image x, which may include cat and dot. Or, but this could could be thousands of classes. The standard classification uh, uh, way to, to do this is to uh, apply this classifier on top of an image and pick the class that, that have the highest confidence. But this is not what we want to do here. So we, we, we this is uh, possible if we have examples for class, we can train these classifiers. But in our case, we actually need to synthesize classifiers. We need to go and the model of function phi that takes as an input a language a description of possibly an unseen class and predict the visual classifier that can we can it can we can then execute in an image. And the higher the confidence of this phi of X, the predicted classifier on an image, the more it is expected to be related to the language described in this and this language description. So we want to synthesize a visual classifier from, from here. So, <coughs> so, so the, the approach back then in 2013 was, was a simple uh, linear projection. So we assume that we uh, have a representation of the of the OTDR. In this case, we use the simple TF-IDF representation, like, which is basically unique words uh, in the article. Uh, had that had each each uh, uh, one of these words is weighted by its frequency multiplied by an inverted document frequency, which is a downweighting factor related to how how this word is common. If it's common, then I would wouldn't uh, rely that uh, it, uh, on it as a distinguishing word uh, between different classes. So uh, and uh, the images we can we use at this time uh, class me features, which is uh, one of the uh, I would say popular features at that time, but we applied it later also on deep features. <coughs> and the idea is actually how do we relate uh, a language description T i to an image x j. And note that this language description in this case comes comes at the category level versus at the image level. So in image captioning, for example, you have five images per five captions per, per image. In this case, you have one language description per the entire uh, bird category or class category. So in order to relate these to each other, we uh, find a constrained uh, optimization task for, all, for where the input is every pair of text ti and image xj. And if a text ti and image xj belong to the same class, then we, we would like to encourage this uh, inter-domain uh, similarity between text and image to be high. And if they are not related, uh, mean, meaning, for example, a language description of a purple link and an image from Cardinal, we'd like this to be to be having a small similarity. Uh, so you may imagine that at this time, this this piece actually T, T, uh, T uh, language description T star, in order to convert it as a, to a classifier in this space, we just need to multiply it by W. Because once you multiply it, at w, we, we get a vector that we expect when we execute an image to be relevant to this uh, text description T star. So the uh, classifier synthesis in this case is simply T star W. So, <coughs> but so far we haven't explicitly modeled the notion of imagination in, in this earlier work. Uh, so uh, fast forward. Uh, five years later, we uh, developed an approach that actually explicitly modeled the notion of imagination. In this case, it's a, we call this a, a degenerator in our case. So how does this work? We assume that we have a, a, a language description. We input this into a generator that can hallucinate or imagine how this bird may look like in different ways. <coughs> and if we assume that this net works as expected in a way that, that enable the state discrimination between different classes that could be similar in language but different in small features. We we may lay out the unseen class classification task into a standard supervised classification task because if we have that and it works uh, as expected, 
uh, it, it will be able to generate fake data for each unseen class based on its language description. So we generate class, this fake data for class one, class two, class three, and this may cover maybe thousands of species if, if it works properly. <coughs> so that's the key idea, but the problem is how to model this so that it behaves, it, 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 it actually matches these expectations. Um, so the, the, the key idea is based on a, a dominant generated model uh, called created, uh, Generated Adversarial Methods uh, proposed by uh, Ian Goodfield and colleagues in Europe 2014. And uh, we actually rely on a modi modified version of this approach, a conditional version of it, that takes as an input the language description of, of a class, let's say Reservoir, and a series of random numbers, which is the represents the uh, variations within that class. And it takes uh, uh, it, it, these two together undergoes a series of operations, which is the generator, or the imaginary in our case, sometimes we call it that way. And this finally produces the uh, image or the visual features that we, we expect to match this language description. <coughs> there is also, uh, uh, this image is then fit into another network, the, the discriminator, that is uh, uh, trying to predict um, uh, fake, uh, fake if the input comes from the generator, and it, it is trying to predict uh, real if the input comes from the training data. These two networks are trained simultaneously, and the generator receives a signal from the discriminator to update its parameters so that this uh, feature uh, uh, is looks more and more like a burst. So it is this is trying to trick this into believing that it is real, and at the same time, since we, this is conditional, we trained it to also be predictive of the class that this belongs to. So we have, uh, for the sake of simplicity, I didn't add this. Uh, additional information, but there's an additional head here for classes, for all the classes. And we also encourage the, the, the one we generate a feature for Reservoir, we have a bin for that uh, for that class as well. And we we encourage this the discriminator to also be predictive of which uh, visual features this class belongs to. So if it's Reservoir, if it is, it is generated from Reservoir language description, it should predict uh, the Reservoir class. Um, so this is an instance of conditional uh, like GANs, which is also a topic that has been studied at that time. So we took the state of the art conditional GAN model from Odena et al. at ICML 2017, and we, we tried that at the baseline. But the general features lack enough discrimination and discrimination to enable successful zero shot learning. So you can see that the uh, generations are really confused, and the performance is expected in, with that confusion to be poor, which is what we found in our experiments. So we need to do something to improve the, uh, uh, the uh, separations between classes and to, to, to make it better. So we added a regularizer we call the visual pivot. And uh, the, the, the aim of this class, this is summation over all the same classes. So we use during training. Uh, a, a class description and stuff image every scene class. So, and we have the expectations over the uh, generated features. So, for for that, for each one of these classes, we can generate a bunch of features, uh, and then we can compute the average features. So, this is basically the mean features of class, let's say, uh, Western Gaul. So, we go for the Western Gaul. We have the we, we have the language description, which we use generated to generate a set of features. We compute its expectations, mean we get its average. So we have the average fake features for, for the class Western Gaul. We'll do the same for the fake data, but we average the real features of the Western Gaul. And what we encourage is that this average of, uh, of, fake, of fake data should match, as, as, uh, should be as close as possible to the average of the real data. And this is some. This is done for uh, some over all the C classes. And this will help us to go from this picture to to this picture. So the a really confused embedding of classes uh, to more distinguished and discriminative embedding that makes the task easier for for prediction. Uh, so this is just some more more architectural details. Uh, 
we generate in this work, we generate the, we generate the visual appearances in the feature space. Uh, but one of the things that I uh, would like to highlight is this component. Since uh, a language description of classes could be noisy, uh, the typical practice is to associate the noise vector z with the label directly. But so, since this does not give the model a chance to suppress the noise, if there are some words in the text could be irrelevant, we don't, have, we don't give the model a room to suppress this noise. In order to give the model more room to suppress this noise and to have, uh, to have that uh, opportunity, we, we added a noise suppression layer on top of the language description, in this case still TFIDF. Uh, and the, the purpose of this uh, layer before concatenation with uh, the noise vector Z is to suppress this noise. So this will give the model a room to, to maybe set the connections to the a noisy word very close to, to be very close to zero, and hence it, this word would be less predictive of the of the visual appearance of this, and at least would give it a room. So we 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 tried this and we found that actually it works. This this notion of suppressing noise, of course, is of course not new, but integrating it this way, it has been studied previously in some uh, in some works with by encouraging sparsity explicitly. So I look, I I, I encourage them to look. Uh, on a sparse set of words, because I imagine that the rest could be noisy. But we found that by the predictive power of the generator, this is not required. So when we added that loss, a diversity loss, by explicitly, we didn't notice a, a performance improvement uh, uh, than removing it. Because if, if I rely a lot on noisy data, the generations would be less predictive to, to the visual appearance that that passes the loss criteria that that GANs generates uh, that GANs encourages by uh, encourages natural, I would say. Uh, so the, we tried this on a benchmark of uh, 200 uh, on multiple data sets, but just here for for the sake of uh, an, an example, uh, we tried this on 200 uh, bird species. 100, we 150 of those for uh, training and the rest for, for testing. So, <coughs> so, so this is the results actually on the CARP data set with this split. So the performance of GAN only, which is uh, uh, Odanital ICML uh, 17, was 22%. Uh, and visual different regularizer, which is um, the, the loss that we added separately, is 28%. But if we added two, these two together, like uh, the performance is the final, our final approach was uh, 43%. So each one of these individually does not beat the state of the art, but both of them helps each other to achieve uh, performance that is better than the state of the art. Um, this is just so that if we remove the noise suppression layer I just talked about in the past slide, you, 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 you will you'll see a drop of about 3%. Which shows that this noise suppression is actually helpful. Uh, here, uh, here is just the same thing, but on another data set that is bigger. Like any bird data set is have 500 birds instead of uh, 200. Uh, so this shows some context uh, uh, beyond the appellation. This shows some context compared to other earlier approaches at that time that does not use explicitly the notion of generation or uh, imagination. So, <coughs> so the performance uh, like uh, gap is about maybe 6 to 7%. And, and this shows that mod explicitly modeling this notion is, is somehow helpful for uh, zero-shot recognition. This has also been observed in some other parallel works. That Zianithel uh, is a paper that also use, uses uh, variational autoencoders instead of GANs. And it, it, it appeared at the same conference. And this is some work at, and, uh, using generator, but not again for um, future dynamics. So this is just some other parallel work that have, that have similar uh, observations uh, as as, uh, as ours. Uh, this, <coughs> this is basically somehow a five-year summary of probably my own journey on this task. So the first approach was I was I, at ICCV, twenty-six percent. And then I developed uh, in TPAMI a nonlinear kernel version. It's still not deep learning. Uh, 
uh, and achieved 33%. And then modeling the part notion means that the, uh, detecting the parts of the birth so that you you can you give a, the model a chance to link the head part uh, 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 the, of the bird to a word beak. So if, you have, if, if, you have, if you say something like orange beak, this component of this word is related more to the head part of the bird. So this is more like part visual planning with where, where it makes uh, parts more explicitly accessible. And it shows that by making this uh, happen, you improve the performance from 33 to 37. And finally, adding to that a uh, visual imagination component uh, helps improve the performance also on over 6%. Uh, Okay. Yeah. So, <coughs> so this, this is just a reflection on how why this could be useful. So we sometimes encounter a situation which I'm saying this I'm playing, uh, uh, chase a bird like this, or you know, uh, encounter a bird and, and it flies away and out, out of nowhere. And in other situations, we uh, we might uh, find uh, encounter a bird and his and this time we have to fly away. Uh, in, in both situations, from from environmental perspective, we care both about the, the bird and, and the pair. Uh, and we want to recognize them at the fine grained level, so that maybe we count how many species do we have for each one of these. And this may help decision makers to do something to, to protect this, because we'll have more, more information. So, so this can help uh, the environment in a way that, for example, this kid who, uh, who just uh, missed the bird, uh, and he, he didn't have a chance to pick a picture because the bird fly away. All the other pictures where we also don't have a, a chance to take a picture of the bird that is chasing us. Uh, so, but we can ask, we can, we can remember how, to, how it looked like, and we can feed this to this robot who loves the environment and, and, uh, and describe and, and ask more questions and make, make, make sure that uh, what we exactly means and it gives us an answer that we could be happy with. So, this, this shows the potential that of this, how this may help uh, real problems uh, because we naturally don't have access to. To to let that information at the world scale, like maybe in this case tens of thousands of bird species, we don't have data, so we need to have some capability to to uh, understand. And also, this gives access to uh, almost everybody to contribute because everybody can describe this bird in, in in some language, and this will help. Maybe can can make the reporting of the sites of this uh, creature maybe orders of magnitude of what we have now, and the more information we have, the better decisions we can make. Yeah, so yeah, this is actually- Hi everyone, I'm Mohamed Hussein, an AI researcher at Facebook, oh, and today I'm going to show the, you the, how artificial intelligence could be uh, an extra arm to help uh, mother uh, nature. I just give you the, the yeah, that, that was a flavor uh, of it, but I, I, when I, when I observe it, one of the things that I observe it in, in this UN meeting that uh, a lot of World leaders are care a lot about the role of AI to to help the creatures and uh, and, and, and and maintain the biodiversity levels and protect the loss of the creatures uh, these creatures. So <clears throat> now I'm drifting a little bit towards the imagination to create. So this is more about the use of of generation generative models to. Uh, uh, create novel content, create a likable content, like art uh, uh, and fashion. Um, and in this work, I, I'm starting by uh, a work that we developed in 2017 called Creative Adversarial Networks. Uh, and the key idea of this is to take maybe the image that we have in the art history, collect them, and, and try to uh, hallucinate new uh, art style from them that we hope that it could be likable. The inspiration is coming from uh, Cole Martindale, who is actually a Canadian psychologist. Uh, and what he's saying, this is in the context of human creativity. Uh, and the x-axis here is, you can think of as novelty against what we, we know. And y-axis is hedonic value, you can think of it as likability, how much I do like an art piece. 
uh, that is created in this context by human. And if this is showing that if uh, uh, something, uh, an art piece is, is not too novel, people may not like it. But as novelty increases, people will start to like the work more and more, if it's a meaningful deviation. But, uh, uh, but not too long, not for too long after some point when, they, when it's too novel to understand and relate to what we know. Uh, such lack of that such uh, uh, deviation will lead to lack of understanding, and lack of understanding will lead to lack of appreciation. So that that was basically the the and this also may relate to maybe some of the uh, papers that we submit to in Europe. I see it well. It's too hard to relate to literature. People tend also to be skeptical uh, when it's the when it's 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 well connected to literature. People and it have novelty component. People will 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 be more excited about. It. Uh, so uh, it's the, the component, the core component that this belts on top is, is still generated at the same network. But if we trained uh, uh, GANs to based on artwork and the, that we have in the history uh, of art, we might expect to generate the Mona Lisa again. Of course, Mona Lisa is a beautiful picture, but, but it's not, if we consider this from a creativity perspective, it's not a new thing. So the question is, how do we uh, encourage generative models by, uh, by a learning signal that guides it to explore the creative space of image generation in a way that could be meaningful? So what we did is that we, uh, we uh, used uh, in the, in the, the uh, data set called WikiArt, which has more than um, 80,000 art uh, uh, pictures from the collected from centuries of, of uh, artwork. <coughs> and this may include abstract art, cubism, impressionism, higher instance, which is art movements that happens to emerge in, in the past century. And we did something actually simple. So we added an additional piece of uh, additional uh, head into the discriminator that, that encouraged the discriminator not only to say that this is real or fake, but also to for, for when the input is a real image, to be predictive of which class it belongs to. So this is the one, the first uh, modification we did. Uh, and, and notice that here this is not a conditional GAN model. This takes uh, as an input only a Z vector. So we have the discriminator. If the input is a real image, we predict that it's. We encourage this to predict that this is real, and also to predict which cla which class this belongs to. In this case, the Mona Lisa is high Renaissance. So we we encourage the, the model to be <coughs> to be to predict high Renaissance in this case. Uh, now, for for the generation perspective, we added add an additional class that encourages the model to to have that deviation, to make a room for images like this to emerge. And the way we, 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 we uh, uh, encourage that is by, uh, encourage, by looking at the response of the discriminator on the existing art styles, and encouraging the generated image to be more like entropic over the existing art movements, meaning this image should be hard to classify to any of the existing art movement. And that was the notion of deviations that we, we, we uh, this is the way that we were trying to model this notion of deviation. So for example, if we have an image like Mona Lisa, the, the, this will predict, this will be easy to predict which class it belongs to, uh, and this will be low entropy, low deviation, or low creativity. If the image is an image like that, which does not belong to any of the existing art movement, the entropy will be high, and the creativity loss will be high, or the deviation loss in a way. So, so that's that's the the key idea. The question is how does this relate to the inspiration from Colin Martin, though? Um, they, they, there are different ways to define the deviation. So maybe a simpler way to, or, or a more, a more, uh, another way to do this is to add an additional class k plus one, and we encourage the, all the images that comes from the generator to be classified to the class k plus one, which is an, the new art uh, movement, 
but this will encourage the patient to be hard to relate to the classes that I have seen, the existing classes. And this notion of lack of relatedness may push it too far to fall into this regime, which, what we, which is what we observed in the experiment. So the people tend to list like they work. If we encourage the genetic to generate a class K plus one, then an image that is entropic over the existing art movement, so it's, which encourages, encourages it to be more like a combination or being inspired from this art movement to generate a new one. So this, this relatedness component is is what what uh, um, explains why the entropic uh, uh, learning signal is 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 a better way to to model the deviation from existing uh, art movements. So these are some of the examples that has been generated by by Ken. Uh, and you may have seen that it varies in, in the structure and content. And these are, uh, compared to the existing work, this is this is this is uh, un unseen existing maybe uh, images in the training. <coughs> um, human subject experiments. We um, we we did uh, ask people to check, would, or we, we evaluated the images according to the Turing test. Does people think that this is generated by a human versus a machine? And it, it, it outperforms CAN by about 10%, uh, CAN by about 10%, uh, but it's still actually the, the abstract, uh, like a piece of art, like abstract uh, uh, expressionist, which is a uh, classic art. It is easier for people to say that this is done by human, because most people are familiar with with what that is, because it's a classic art, and most people have seen it, like the Mona Lisa picture. Art Basel is a quite recent art movement, which has a, an annual conference. Uh, you may, you may, I'm not sure some of you have seen the the banana stickers that has been sold for four hundred twenty thousand. This test was from Art Basel, actually, two thousand nineteen. Uh, <coughs> So uh, most most of the pictures here are, are actually abstract, except uh, apart from the banana, I guess. Uh, and and this explains why people are, are easy to trick that this is this is done by machine because the more abstract the art is, the more likely people to, could could believe that it's generated by machine. So this is the. Uh, this is also some some dimension that we we borrowed from how people study real art, and we we measure this. This is not this for elements are not our proposal. Uh, just uh, use some uh, ask people questions about these elements, uh, which is what how people use to study real art, and we showed some <coughs> promising score compared to also some of the real art or some of the um, the like. Like the machine trained about. So, uh, so the the work has 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 uh, has been, for example, invited to some of the uh, professional art galleries uh, to for the section called um, Human Art in Frankfurt Book Fair, uh, and yeah, has uh, has uh, shown some some interest in the in the community. Make sure that we put our code out there. The problems that we're trying to solve are the sorts of problems that no individual is going to solve on their own. And probably no one organization is going to solve. It's expected to be featured in a two minute video of Fair. And uh, I like it. This is also another it's piece really that cool. uh, suffers one of the art pieces that was made by this method in the. In the it's actually the first work of art made by uh, Adam uh, Sorry, I'm like the other guy. So, um, so. Later, we, we uh, also work it on, on thinking how this may help actually fashion industry. Uh, and what excites us here is that this could this is something that also impacts our everyday life, uh, and and uh, and also cre creativity or exploring the creative space of generation covers not only texture but also the shape uh, of of of, uh, of uh, a fashion piece. So uh, there is a big potential for this, and I would say the the the, the key difference between this and, and CAM was basically modeling two dimensions of deviation, one for shape and one for texture, and we also explore some other loss functions. So in in CAM we we only 
explore the entropy using binary cross entropy. In this case, we use multi class cross entropy. Cell has really divergence. We try to explore different infor uh, information divergence measure to see if the, the may lead to better results. Um, so it's, it's in flavor is, is similar, but we use different loss functions for deviation. Um, and and we, we found actually a way to measure, uh, like so far we get inspiration from this wounded curve, but, but we did not actually find a way to reproduce it. Uh, we, we, here we're trying to study, we're trying to plot that more explicitly where the x-axis is the novelty measured by the average new sleeper to the training data. So the more, the higher distance from the, the highest the average new sleeper distance of images written by a model from the training data, the more novel it is expected to be. And the y-axis is like ability uh, rated by humans. So we can plot every model here as a point. So in, in this case, you find, for example, CAMH is the newer version of CAM that uses more better entropy measures, and this is the one that, 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 that uh, the 2017 version. <coughs> and maybe one may question why GAN is here. Uh, so in this particular project, we have only a few thousand images, like 4,000 images. And when you have l less data, you might see actually images from GAN that have glitches. And these glitches make the model have a, an average nearest neighbor distance high, but not necessarily in a likable way. That's why this is really low in terms of people don't like it. In fact, actually, if you use GAN plus classification, mean that you have the image, you use a GAN, GAN the, 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 the vanilla GAN model does not use class labels. But if you use additional information, like you add an additional classification head to the GAN to be predictive of which class this image belongs to for real data, this makes the training more stable. And the images uh, and, and the ability of the model to reproduce images from the training data to be better. And the, this GAN is here, but GAN plus classification is actually far on the left. So the, but it's still not as likable as 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 can models. Is that clear? Please feel free to ask me questions if things are are not clear. So that's So these are some of the generations that you may relate to. Um, but one example is this uh, pants with extended arm sleeves. So this is a non-existing shape in the data set. So the, it, 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 the, the, the data set has pants and t-shirts. So it learns somehow to mix both together. <laughs> and, and you may actually see that some of these, uh, if you think more about some of these main shapes, you might relate that it could be a mix of some of the other, maybe, clothing that you, you may know about. Um, yeah, so, yeah, we, uh, the, the work was presented in the ACCV workshop on design and creativity, and we got the, we thank IPM Research for receiving an award for this. And we also got invited for the, to cover this in the F8 uh, uh, Facebook conference, which is the, the main conference that, that Facebook releases uh, features like Facebook Live and things like that. <coughs> so, so now I'd I'll, I'll like to, the, to show some connection between these two. Uh, so creativity and this, this, we have shown so far the ambiguity of predicting unseen classes encourages the model to be more capable of generating uh, unseen images that could be of uh, that could be likable in, in a way. But this we can reflect on this on the perspective of a zero shot learning, because creativity is about creating a likable unseen, and in the context of generative zero shot learning, 
uh, it, 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 generative gestural planning is about uh, understanding the unseen and a like, a likable understanding of uh, an unseen in the, in the context of generation is being able to generate images that deviate from the training classes so that it is distinguishable, but not too much in a way that this will transfer from the same classes. So if you reflect more on the same figure, but from the perspective of zero-shot learning, and we plot the x-axis as novelty against seeing classes. And uh, what we hope is to generate features, given the language description of an unseen class, uh, that is distinguishable from seeing classes. In this picture, you may see that this is a crystal booklet and this is Berkey booklet. This is a seeing class. Both of them has like orange peak and the plumage also looks similar in a way. But what distinguishes this from this is this curved feather that comes from the top of the head of the crystal booklet class. So the language description of these two could be similar. So if we, 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 we have a degenerate, a degenerate generative zero-shot learning approach, it might be tricked to generate the same features as this class. But this is not what we want to do. We want to encourage the generation of the crystal Oakland to deviate from parakeet Oakland to make it distinguishable, to be more like here, not, not here but not too much to disable transfer from the same classes because we learned this orange peak from here and also features like plumage. So that's, that, that, that's, that's the reflect, that's, you can think of this as a reflection of creativity, but here it is more to transfer learning. So the, the bottom part is the model that I started this talk with, like in the beginning, the generative short learning approach in CVPR 18. What, what's different is actually the top part. So we it constructed a mini patch. A mini patch, the, the first, the, the bottom mini patch is the same as the CVPR 18 that uses uh, images of scene classes and language description of also scene classes. The difference is that here we have another mini patch that explicitly explores the unseen classes. So we hallucinate language descriptions of unseen classes. So let's say that we have these two, three classes or the seen classes. In, in the, in the CVPR 18, we use a language description of each one of these classes and the corresponding images. The, the bottom mini patch tries to explore actually on the dark, that dark space and extract some learning signal. By well, what we do is that we hallucinate language description here in, on, of unseen classes. And we generate, we take this, we, from this hallucinated language description, we hallucinate visual appearances. Hallucinate language description of unseen classes and then hallucinate uh, visual appearances. So what we know is that these visual uh, features are from are, are for unseen classes that should be hard to classify to the existing seen classes because we explicitly explore things that we hope to be unseen, and that's actually what explains this. Since this is uh, unseen. We, 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 we encourage them all to classify this as, re as real, to be tricked, and at the same time that degenerated features to be hard to classify to the same classes. So, and the way we did it, it was a simple thing. So we, we picked to, in order to, the question is how do we hallucinate language description? In this context, we, we did something simple. We picked two uh, uh, same uh, classes, he, a and T B, and we and we, we we pick a random uh, um, value alpha from point two to point eight, and we interpolate between them. So this is somehow pick this language description and pick this language description, and pick an alpha between point two and point eight, uh, and and we assume that this is something that should that we tell the model, hey, this is something that you should not be you should be confused as seen. So you can think of this additional loss as a regularizer. 
by, and the, way, the reason why we picked this interpolation is that those classes that are tricky are those that are most similar to C classes. And that's why we try to pick this in neighborhood of C classes versus being breaking something that is really far. Uh, and this is a like an entropy loss, like making this hard to classify by different entropy measures. So here you see the difference between the model without this loss and with this loss. So the only addition is just the, the creativity inspired loss. So in this case, we, we explicitly looked at these two classes that we know are very similar. And what we observed is that the, the performance on, on uh, this seen unseen curve, which is the way people use two classes to, to, to evaluate uh, generalization planning, has doubled, almost doubled in this particular case. But more generally, this is across the entire set, set of unseen classes. You, you can still uh, see the difference between this blue and red uh, lines, which reflects the improvement on with the loss and without the loss. Um, this is, we, like, we did that on uh, uh, maybe four benchmarks on, on bird data set, but we also tried this or we'll try this on also other G shot learning tasks. We also try this on three attribute based G shot learning that uses the attributes instead of language description to see if this may generalize. And we observe it that the, uh, an improvement uh, in, in also all these tasks. Uh, this, this loss is actually also orthogonal to which generative G shot learning approach. Over the past year, there was multiple approaches. Uh, that are based on generating uh, visual appearances from language descriptions. But since these losses are orthogonal, we can add this to each one of these uh, generative uh, model-based digital learning approaches. And when we added them, we, it, we found that it improved moves, moves on top of them most of the time. So the key message so far is that we can use generative models to imagine to see, and imagine to create, and also create to see in a way. Uh, I'm not sure how much time we have. Like five minutes. Um, so I think most of what, uh, like maybe the rest is more like a, a sweep over maybe more recent work. work. So I, I have I have been fascinated about the user-generated models uh, since it helped me learn more about understanding unseen objects and creating unseen Im images. So I, I also work it on improving the model themselves in the paper in ICML earlier this year. So it, it, is, uh, it is basically a m model for, for GAN that, uh, that uh, actually helps mode, uh, mode collapse. Um, and, and it's uh, <coughs> one thing I want to say here that this, this is a model that tries to, it is orthogonal to the previous approaches, but just tries to improve generative models in a way that encourages, encourages it to be uh, to solve the mode collapse problem. So if we have a model that, for example, uh, it, it, gets, it gets exposed to images of men and women, let's say, and it generates only men or on, only women, this is not good. So we, we added another loss that is uh, explicitly model diversity. So when, it gener when the model generates only both men and women, then we say that this is a good, good job. And it's it also, it also unsupervised. You don't have to explicitly give them give uh, them and the, uh, the labels to measure diversity. So the more that the, the diversity uh, uh, match the real data, the better. Uh, and it's a batch level loss. So we get a mini batch, we collect the diversity of the mini batch and see if the diversity mini batch matches the, uh, of the fake matches the real. And the more it matches, the better. And this is what helps the model go from, from, from the picture on the far left to the picture on the far right. And, but one thing that we observe it here is, is that the uh, is not only that it, it, it the ability of the model to cover all the modes become better, uh, but also the learning efficiency that it learns to cover all the modes at a high quality in the least number of iterations. Since actually all what what all, what what I have been fascinated about is about learning efficiency. So zero shot learning is an extreme case where we, we, we want to learn something by only getting exposed to language description. But one other reflection of how do we learn fast is to learn quickly. And that's one aspect that we can use to improve, for example, generative models, which is a tool that I have, I have been using a lot. Uh, 
so this is an example where it shows that learning models can models can be more efficient and learn faster if we we define patch level losses, because this is a, this is a mini patch level losses loss versus an example level loss, which is what what I mostly covered before. So this is just. Yeah, this is also another example of where where batch level losses helps. So in this case, it's a few shot learning. It's also uh, learning uh, how do we how do we recognize a set of classes very quickly from from few examples. And in this case, we we'll construct a mini batch. Let's say if this is cat and this is dog, and we have only two examples. I have only few examples. And we have a prototype for every uh, for every class. And we, we construct a random walk inside the mini patch. The given a mini patch of let's say images, uh, we kind of and we have a set of unlabeled data. We have this prototype of a cat or prototype of a dog, and we construct a graph that connects all these nodes. And we encourage that if we start from a prototype of a cat, go for a random walk, go for a walk here. And then after we end, end up after a tiny number of steps, you want to encourage the model to, to confidently specify what you ended up with to the same to the same class you started from. So start from here, go for a walk, classify yourself back here. And the red, red class, start from here, go for a walk, and then classify yourself back here. So this loss encourages the model to be more compact and well separated in the least number of iterations. So in this, uh, I think in, if you have many many examples per, per class, this might not be well needed. But this this is just also a, 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 an example of a mini patch level loss that encourages the learning efficiency and that improves the learning efficiency if you don't have much training data. Uh, and this this shows the improvement of this learning loss. Like this, you add this to the standard multi class based interview loss. <laughs> and this shows that if you add this random one class, uh, the improvement against the base lines increases uh, as the classification task gets harder. So the 800 classification ways, the improvement over the base line gets, gets up to 60%. Uh, yeah. We should probably wrap up because there yeah. is a talk that's supposed to start. Right. Sure. Let, I, I'm, I'm wrap, let me wrap up. So. One maybe one uh, other thing that I reflect sometimes reflect on is that uh, lifelong learning as learning the unseen uh, as as an unseen classification or uh, so uh, uh, lifelong learning is about learning a sequence of tasks uh, up until in, in a time domain in time domain but what, what sometimes I, I think of is that uh, the future task is so far from me unseen so how do I prepare for these these some unseen tasks to so that my transferability becomes better when I get there. Uh, this, is, this shows, for example, that semantic guidance helps uh, uh, the ability of the model to perform the task zero shot without seeing any examples improves over time as we use language or attributes. Uh, let me just wrap up. Um, um, yeah, so in, in, in summary, uh, this is mostly what I work on, visual understanding for uh, mean few shot planning, zero shot planning, and visual generation, and thank you. Great, is, um, is, let's see, is Frank here? Okay, but yeah, so in the meantime, uh, why don't we take uh, questions? questions? Okay. I, I, I'll ask you a question related to. Uh, uh, can you can you uh, create conditional GANs that where you can specify the one you want for the types of uh, for the types of categories that you're looking to get? Because the, when you were interpolating with the point two and the point eight, that, that looked a lot like a conditional GAN. Uh, oh, we, uh, so, uh, let me go back to the. Slide. 
Yes, here. So, uh, what's your question again? Oh, it, I mean, th this starts to look a lot like a conditional GAN where, where you can condition it on the category that you want to yes. generate. Yes, yeah, okay. yes. But uh, it is a condition, but it's a condition based on exploring uh, this track C out here. This condition on a hallucinated uh, language description of an unseen class, and this is based on explicit exploration. So in order to give okay, so it is okay. So so it, it is a conditional again in that sense, but it's, it's forcing the the exploration. Yeah, because position planning we we generate based on a language description. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, this is based on exploration around what we know, understand in a way that tries to extend the generalization. I've got lots of other questions later, but we should maybe we should. Uh, sorry, sorry for the yeah, yeah, the no, no, very good. Thank you. Yeah, great. Stuff.